And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways company possible. <laughs> Fucked it up already. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple, coming to us straight from ninth level games, formerly of Maze's fame, now with the fit, with the role-playing adaptation of Return to Dark Tower, the one and only Chris, don't call him O'Donnell, O'Neill. <laughs> yeah, don't call me O'Donnell, it's not my name. <laughs> uh... Uh, in I fact, had to... it's funny. There are two, uh, there are two separate Chris O'Neills in gaming. Two completely separate people with different names that are both pronounced Chris O'Neill. So I hope I hope ne I hope both of you aren't in the same room at any point. No, I, I mean uh, only at conventions. Uh, Chris O'Neill O N E A L is uh, one of the guys from Brotherwise Games. Mm -hmm. uh, they make a they make some cool board games, and you know I make some cool role playing games. So yeah. um, it's all good. As an aside, I had to have a bit of a laugh that the Kickstarter account for ninth level has backed six hundred and sixty six projects. Uh, yeah, we uh, I, I've actually like held off buying anything on Kickstarter for a while just because it's super fun um, uh, being at six hundred and sixty six backed projects. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, more than half of those are role playing zines, um, you know, uh, but it's still a pretty ridiculous number. Uh, you probably uh, go, you probably go to town on um on Zine on Zine Quest. Yes, yes, Zine Quest has been uh actually really uh fun and, and and kind of important for ninth level. It really put us back into hardcore on uh, making sure that we were making as many indie RPGs as possible. So Although it's not like I'm one to talk because my, because I've be, because bet between between my two accounts, I've pro between the two the original account that I have in the back and the backup that I made, um, I've got just under four hundred and I, I all but all but tw all but um twenty of them are um get are game related. Yeah, I kind of sure. I kind of wish the pie would separate between um tabletop games and video games instead of just putting them all in games. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, I have three slices, uh, yet to fill in on my, on my pie, uh, uh, which is a fun little game. And, and I sometimes just look to see if maybe something cool comes out in one of the areas that I'm missing. Um, cause I would like to fill in the pie. Um, I'm sure the moment I do, they'll come out with a couple of new, uh, a couple of new categories so that I will no longer have a complete pie. Mm -hmm. Oh, that that's that's the way it goes. The pie is a lie, and the cake is a fake. Wait, reverse Definitely that. Fake. This... So the cake is always a lie. Especially, especially since my colleagues always want to give me chocolate cake, assholes. I have uh, five hundred and seventy nine of my back projects have been games. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, now. Mm -hmm. Given that, given that this is a this is as I understand it, a adaptation of the board game of the same name, just using yeah. the mazes system that we've talked we've talked about the last time I had you on. Yeah. So, uh, Return to Dark Tower is based on Restorations Restoration Games, uh, you know, brand new version of the classic Dark Tower. So it's, mm -hmm. um, it's but it's based on the the new game Re Return to Dark Tower. Um, it is completely compatible with mazes, meaning that you can take mazes characters and you can play with them in Return to Dark Tower. Um, but Return to Dark Tower is different in the fact that it is focused on a multi-game campaign where each of the players plays both a hero and then they have a companion, which is like a regular mazes character. Um, and you are, uh, as a group, spent. you have one year to try to defeat the adversary that has taken over the Dark Tower. Yeah. And give, now, given, the, given that, I guess the best, I guess the big question is, did, 
polymorph approach did polymorph approach not polymorph but um did ninth level yeah, approach did, restoration yeah or, or was it the other way around so um we're, we're actually good friends with some of the designers at restoration um especially brian neff um who's one of the designers on return to dark tower and so we got to play the board game very early in development and it struck us that it was similar uh that it could like be lined up against mazes uh there was just so much synchronicity that it was like this seems like such a good idea so we set up a meeting uh and uh, uh justin and rob uh who run uh restoration um were both very much interested in the idea of doing a role-playing game but knew that they themselves um didn't have the bandwidth or you know you know it's not really their space so they were excited to partner with us mm -hmm. um and they've been awesome to work with um they've given us you know basically uh, a free hand uh but have been very involved since the beginning so it's been great yeah now as somebody who's on the outside looking in when it comes to dark when it comes to dark tower um yeah. to the point where to the point where when i found out about this I stupidly confused it with the Stephen King book series. <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny. I mean, and don't get me wrong. If Stephen King would like to license the Dark Tower to us, we would definitely also do the Dark Tower. Um, but even now, one of our writers, uh, uh, Patrick Clapp, who wrote a lot of Adventures for Mazes, he thought it was that, too. Um, the original board game came out in 1981, hmm. um, and it was, at the time, Milton Bradley's attempt to... Um, create a Dungeons and Dragons game, and it just really showed that they had no idea what Dungeons and Dragons was. Um, Although I, I have to ask the question: Were they were they more were they more or less on point than Dragon Strike? Uh, uh, way <laughs> less on point. Um, <laughs> and never forget that Dragon Strike um, was produced by TSR. TSR made that game. I, I looked at I looked at Dragon Strike as an attempt as an attempt to try and dip into what HeroQuest was doing while also being a beginner's guide to A D and D. Yeah, that's really what we had hoped it was gonna be. And and I'm a huge fan of Dragon Strike because the video is one of the funniest things. Oh <laughs> yes. I one of these days I pl I plan on doing a a, a watch and react to that to that video just so I can inflict it on some of the people of this channel. <laughs> oh yeah, I, love, I mean I love it. it the floating head, uh, you know. In, in fact, we've given homage to it in some of our mazes uh, stuff because uh, the line is, you know, uh, are you brave enough? You yeah. know, <laughs> uh, that, that's really you know uh, you know from Dragon Strike and and Dragon Strike came out in the early '90s, like so around 1990. One or nineteen ninety two, mm -hmm. um, uh, but like uh, the Dark Tower is similar to it in the fact that it was an attempt to use modern technology to like do this thing. And um, the original Dark Tower game was a computerized um, tower. Um, it had a little LCD uh, uh, like numbers, and then the inside of the tower worked kind of like an old pinball machine, um, where it would spin and it would light up a slide inside the tower um, because obviously at that time, putting a computer screen in something would have cost hundreds of dollars. Um, I, you know, it's some to me, it's not to me. It sounds like Milton Brad Milton Bradley had seemed to have this bad habit and dark tower is no, dark tower is not an isolated case with this of building an entire board game around one gimmick. Yeah, um, absolutely. This was the thing, and we're just going to use that piece, and that's the game. If um, I'd say, I'd say a big another famous example of this kind of this mode of thinking is Mousetrap, or our earliest our earliest introduction to a Rube Goldberg machine. The uh, uh, yeah, and, and and like Mousetrap, it was a game that had amazing table presence, but the game itself, in uh, hindsight, wasn't super great. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, but it had great art and had great presence, and a lot of people really remembered it fondly. So, um, the the idea there was so much space um, for restoration to work with, 
um, that, you know, really the similarities, it has the same um, world map um, and it has a dark tower that sits at the center of the board. Um, and you play adventurers traveling around. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of where the similarities end. Um, um, but there's just a lot of the same heart. And we brought a lot of that same heart to the role-playing game. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where it, it, it is really this idea of we're powerful, uh, we're powerful heroes, and we are trying to stop a great evil. Um that is much more powerful than us at the beginning. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's mazes is about um, mazes is a role playing game. that's focused on the like sword and sorcery ideals. Like uh, I'm just a guy with a sword, just trying to get by in the world. And this is a, a different kind of story. It's that, uh, you know, far more the Lord of the Rings, the we're putting together, uh, an army to fight against this great evil. Um, and so it's, it, it is different in its goals, but mechanically, um, it's very similar. Um, and, and like I said, the actual monsters and characters themselves are compatible in both games, mm -hmm. um, which is really fun. Um, and with that, with that in mind, I'd like you. I'd like you to walk me through if if there is if there is any one particular um, moment or mechanic or system within the, within the board game where you where you guys realized this could really work within our system. Yeah, there were a lot. Um, uh, so the first thing that happened is is just the actual core. So in the game, in the board game, you have a character, and your character has. Um, a core ability called a banner, right? And so at the beginning of your turn, if you want, you can do your banner action. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, then your other, you have four other potential actions. You can um, clear a part of the board. You can go and you can battle something. Um, or, uh, you, you know, so you can stand up to evil. You can try to gain resources or you can battle. And when we actually start to look at things, we're like, oh, this is the same as key books, Blade, you know, uh, key books, boots, blades, bones, like it, it, it lined up. And in the tower itself, they use these glyphs. So they use these little icons that show up on the tower and they light up. Um, and even just the icon iconography was similar to the iconography that we were working as we were working on mazes at the time. And so it was just like um, the fact this this synchronicity was like really we were like okay I get it and in mazes we have um, stars that allow you to power your activities mm -hmm. and in uh, Return to Dark Tower you have spirit um, you know again now where things defer uh, and diverge um, you know the actual board game is more of a you know a strategy and resource game it's about moving around and collecting resources and using them to prevent other things. Um, but there is this activity about going down into the dungeons. You can explore dungeons. And when you get to that point, it's so similar to mazes that that was where that initial, like, oh, oh, we got it. This is, this is something I remember, like, I was like, I got quiet and I never shut up. Right. And I like, <laughs> was sitting there at the table and I was just like, like staring off into space, thinking about it when my team was like, are you, uh, what are you thinking about there? You know? And it was like, uh, I think we could do this role playing game. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that in the fullness of time, uh, people that are interested in the board game um, will give the role playing game a shot, and that people that play the role playing game will, um, you know, play the board game because they are different experiences about the same shining core. Mm -hmm. um, and given the, given that i w since obviously um, obviously uh, i'd say a fair bit of people who are who are going to be jumping on this are prop are so there's a lot of them who are going to be familiar with the board game yeah but i'd say there's ju there's just as much who are going to be more familiar with mazes and really that's the angle that uh, that i'm tackling because obviously i haven't had i haven't had re anybody from restorations in the temple yet <laughs> Um, but I'd like, but when it comes to banners, books, and and etc., I'd like to go go into each of them to kind of 
expl- uh, kind of explore what those what those avenues entail. We ca- sure. I remember we did this sim- a similar thing with the core attributes in mazes. So um, in um, uh, in Return to Dark Tower, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, I'll come back to Banner. So the the second piece is books, exactly like it is in mazes. Right. Mm-hmm. I want to do an action that involves, you know, using my mental powers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have boots exactly like mazes because it's about moving. Um, and then we have blades, which originally we were calling battle, which mm-hmm. is what it's called in Return to Dark Tower. But we realized that um, for consistency stake blades, you know, when you say it, you get that it's the battle piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Uh, there is a change and a difference because not only so your your hero character, your core hero character, the, one of the big differences in Return to Dark Tower is that in addition to your character, you also have a force of uh, a force that uh, accompanies you, whether that be soldiers or spies or thieves or you know, a freak or, uh, you know, a herd of bison. It, that That's less important. Yeah. But the reality is that you have some kind of force that you lead. Yeah. Um, and when they are acting, we call it battle. So you would roll battle. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then we have bones, um, as is in mazes, which is about, you know, your force of will and also your physical strength. And then the the top and the bottom, right? So if you roll a one in mazes, we call it your key because it's, it, the key thing about you it's your class core mm-hmm. in return to our character we call it a banner right and it's your banner action so if it's something that your character can do exactly like a key um you know it works but also as you gain key, as you gain banners in the game so over time you can gain resources which are called banners um it allows you to trigger them and use them in the activity mm-hmm. uh, and then instead of crown um, we're using reinforce, um, which is the action in the uh, board game that allows you to gain new followers. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you roll the top of your die, if you roll the four, the six, the eight, or the ten, depending on which polyhedral die you are, um, uh, your force of soldiers, your force of uh, followers, um, you can call them in to resolve the issue. Um, so the smaller your die, the less guys you have, but the more often they're called into play, uh, the larger your die, the more guys you have, um, the less often they're called into play. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the, those two things really change because since we're not just focused on a one and done kind of situation, um, one of the biggest changes between the two systems Whereas the characters are uh, compatible, how we interact with uh, them is slightly different. And one of the biggest changes is called danger. So there are no hearts, there are no hit points per se in Return to Dark Tower. Mm-hmm. Um, the in, in, in instead, any time something negative happens, you are gaining a danger, and then you check against the danger by rolling your die against the current danger. So for your your character, if you have, when you roll, you want to roll higher than the amount of danger that you currently have. Mm-hmm. Uh, if so, everything's okay. Uh, if you roll lower than the amount of danger than you have, then you go down, the adversary gains a resource, um, and there's a chance that something else bad happens. If you roll it exactly, though, you get to clear it. Um, you get to clear all of that danger, and you get to come out on the other side. So... The mechanic is actually really, really straightforward. It's really, really fast. Um, uh, it makes it easier uh, to track, and you don't have to worry about it from game session to game session because it always resets. Um, uh, and it is a change because the hero character, the expectation is, is that the hero character has some form of plot armor, right? Like, you, you're you at least going to make it to the final battle, um, uh, whereas your companions are a free game. Uh uh, and that is definitely a change, but it's really driven by what is, um, you know, what is the experience that the game is trying to push. Mm-hmm. Now, given the fact that one of one of the aspects of the of the hero um, setup is the is their role, um, 
Or is this is roll going to be similar to how it was in mazes, or are there or is there a different um, list of available roles? Uh, so the it, it, it's a different set of classes, but all the classes for mazes are available um, as well. Um, if if you have mazes, um, but from a roles perspective, it is the Paragon, the Vanguard, the Fighter, and the Sentinel. So it's the D4, the D6, the D8, and the D10. Mm-hmm. And that is the same. Um, in fact, the character sheet, which I think is pretty cool, it, look, it, you know, uh, because we're working with Return to Dark Tower, we have some really amazing art assets that we're working with. Um, uh, it has this, like, little box in the center, and it has all the little dice in it, you know, and you can just pick the die. Well, that, so. that's the advantage with working with working with something established. When it comes to art assets, some of the work's already done for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and the art's great, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's not just that uh, it was done for us, it's that it's awesome. Um, <laughs> you, like, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been a true pleasure uh, working uh, with this quality of material. Yeah, it's um, just I I am legally required to be a bit to be a bit of a smart ass. <laughs> uh, and given that I'm get I'm guessing that cl- I'm guessing that when it comes to classes that's l- that's largely unchanged from mazes. There's not any new are there any classes that might be a bit that might be a bit tricky to work with or were they all no. completely compatible? All the mazes classes work. We're going to include uh, all the classes that match to um, the characters that exist in a Return to Dark Tower. So it's actually they're actually going to be all new classes that you could use in mazes. Mm-hmm. Um, so the brutal warlord, uh, for instance, or the cunning spy master, um, are you know not things that exist in mazes, but you could totally play them in mazes. So yeah. Um, in fact, we have a stretch goal um, that we're going to reveal. Restoration Games has shown us what the next expansion characters are going to be, so we're going to reveal them because we'll, we'll include them in the game. So, um, mm-hmm. um, yeah, one of the things that's really nice is right out of the box, like if you um, are already playing mazes, when you get to do a Return to Dark Tower campaign, you could revisit any of the characters that you've used um, in mazes uh, and bring them into this world, or um, you could use the characters that are coming in this set to supplement your new maze, your next mazes game. So. Mm-hmm. I'm, ge- I'm I'm guessing you guys have been go- been going to special lengths to make sure that even though there's that cross compatibility that you're going to be doing that cross compatibility with mazes, um, nobody's stepping on anybody's toes. Uh, yeah, you know we we we've been in lockstep with restoration and we know what's going on, so. Mm-hmm. Also, I mean, these characters don't... The One of the things that's really interesting about the way that the board game is set up is um, since the board game is adjudicated by the tower itself, by the by the app, actually by the app that runs on your phone that's connected to the tower, um, uh, uh, the, the way the characters are created are, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, so they, they, they help directly to the same kind of rulings not rules um that are the characters in mazes existing um uh you know and uh because there is you know you could have two character classes in mazes that are very similar but you know one word is different or one set of edges is different and all of a sudden it's a completely different you know character base um uh since we're not doing anything that directly affects the board game um, even though we're doing lots of things that incorporate aspects of the board game, um, you know, we're not, we're not getting in their way at all. So. Mm-hmm. And with that in, with that in mind, when it comes to now, when it comes to th- when it comes to the companion, um, yeah, I believe that, I believe that's not too far removed from Maze's retainer, but how sim what prompt, what prompted that and how similar or different it is to retainer yeah so the forces um that the hero has is very similar to mazes retainers mm-hmm. so um because it's kind of an extension of your character as like you know i have these guys that work for me whereas companion is a full blown character it's essentially a, an actual mazes character 
um, so that each person at the table is literally playing a hero and a companion. And the idea there is when we talk about these large scale um, epic kind of fantasy things, we're never always going to be right next to each other. And, you know, the warrior has to go fight the troll in the hills while the smarty smarts go off to the temple to read ancient scrolls. And since time and what we're doing and where we are in the world are all important, we wanted to create the opportunity that you have two different characters that you could play so that you can always be involved in the action and it doesn't interact uh, negatively with the narrative. Um, so essentially, at the beginning of every session, or at least every part of every session, you're going to choose which of the characters that you're playing. Um, the expectation um, is that you're going to at least have every player is going to have an opportunity to play their hero um, at least once because each of those heroes has a goal that they are trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, have you, uh, Mildred, have you ever, have you ever heard of a game called The Guy in Reach by Robin Laws? I, ha I have. Okay, so there's this great piece in The Guy in Reach that... I, I love and I've always wanted to use in a game. And it, it is one of the ways, uh, the way that that game works is everyone sits down at the very beginning and says, uh, Quandro's Vorn has wronged me. Uh, and the reason I haven't been able to take him down is X. And as a group, we're creating a set of, uh, a set of things that we need to resolve in order to defeat the enemy. Um, so Return to Dark Tower has pre-existing bad guys that are part of the board game, and so we're going to include them. But we're also going to include this option that says we can create uh, a Quandros Vorn, if you would, similar to the way it's done in Guy and Reach, which I'm very excited for. Um, and so in that situation, each hero would say, uh, this is the thing that is preventing me from taking them down, right? This is the, this is the piece. Because each of the adversaries' uh, powers are based around this idea of a seal. So in the board game, what you are doing is trying to prevent the tower from opening seals because then bad things happen. And they're like seals, like in the idea of the seventh seal, like seals of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Um so in this game, each of your adversaries has a list of seals, and they are trying to spend their resources to unlock them so that they can put them into play, while the players are trying to stop those pieces from happening yeah. or prevent them from happening. Um, and, you know, when I, when I saw these seals and the whole, un and the whole unlocking thing... Yeah. As bad as, this is good, this is going to be another one of my bad jokes for the day, but... I I could see myself adding seven of them simply so simply so I could say that you that the players are the keepers of the seven seas. Right, you are the keeper of the seventh seal. Uh, you know, <laughs> the uh, that's 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 definitely uh, by default. There's only five spaces on the character sheet, mm. but uh, you know, you can make you just print two character sheets, uh, paste them together. I have never found a game that I couldn't hack. Yes, yes. I found a, I found games that forced me to hack, looking at you, Rifts, but never <laughs> ones that I couldn't hack. Right. Now, sp speaking of, speaking of oh. that, speaking of that, when it when it com when it comes to the 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 adversary sheet, um, yeah. And and just the just the way that forces and the like can be presented within the book. Are, are you planning on giving a few examples so that people can have an idea on what ideas they could fi they could fill those things in regarding forces for the um, G for the GM for all intents and purposes. So we're, gonna, we're um, each of the existing adversaries from Return to Dark Tower the board game. We're going to give each of them a series of of uh, their own set seals. Mm -hmm. um, so that you could just look at them and say, oh, these are some examples. I could just steal them. Um, we'll also have a way for you to just uh, – a, a list of, like, here's a bunch of ideas. 
um, but leaving it open for you to create your own and do your own thing. Um, I personally am, um, I like, I like to run it where the, I, with that, uh, putting it onto the players to create what weapons they're giving me, um, which is super fun by, 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 you know, each player saying what, what has prevented them from stopping the adversary already. Um, uh, you know, each player is saying, this is a thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, which gives them an immediate ownership in trying to take down, um, the big bad, um, which, which is an important thing and, and sometimes is really missing in a lot of um, standard role-playing fair. Um, trying to build buy-in. One of the things that we learned with mazes was the idea of the questions at the door to adventure. So by giving you some simple questions when you start the game, um, the you know we're, we're giving you an a, ability to buy into the fiction right away. Um, like, are you trying to kill Bargle because he killed your mom or because, you know, he stole your last beer? Um, that buy-in, you saying what you, what you want to do is telling the game master so much about what you want to do, what mood you're in, what kind of a flavor you want. Um, you know, if some, so if, if, if one player is like, you know, the reason I haven't been able to destroy the adversary um, is because he has my family um, captured in the tower. That like that says something very different than you know. Um, soon I will be powerful enough, and I will drink the magic elixir so that I can beat him up with my fists. Like it's a very different. Uh, it's a different, very different response, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's that's just something that I that I often ask because analysis paralysis as repetitive as it is with, when I talk about it is still a thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. What should we be doing? Um, uh, it, you know, uh, every time I find myself and I put, and, and you know, I put somebody in a, uh, a, a tavern or somewhere to start, you know, uh, I, I'm very, very specifically watching, um, to see how people choose to begin. Um, uh, because a lot of times, uh, you know, us nerds, we like to, you know, we're trying to maximize all the activity. Um, and that can be very difficult. Um, you know, or we're just disaster nerds and we're just like, I burned everything. I put everything on fire. Uh, which is just as likely to happen, actually. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it. it... The dice god, the dice gods love to make people suffer, and every G and every GM has at least a little bit of sadism in them. <laughs> that uh, I I think every GM has at least some level of sadism and some level of masochism, um, or they would not be doing what they're doing. Um, I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. Yeah, usually not. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't think they are usually exclusive. That is true. Now, with that in with that in mind, when it comes to the obvious, obviously being based on the on the board game, there's going to be the inevitable question of what of whether someone needs familiarity with Return to Dark Tower in order to enjoy the role playing game. Um, and I get the feeling from what you from what you said, you've been developing it in mind that this game could be someone's first. Uh, yeah, in fact, um, one of the things that I'm trying to do, um, uh, one of Ninth Level's missions is creating accessible, uh, awesome games, right? Like, our, like, it's not just about making the same thing over and over again. It's about making games that are interesting and cool for people to, to play, but also creating new ways to get people into the hobby, to get people interested. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest barriers to entry for players is they're afraid to run a game. Um, and so we, one of my design principles um, throughout this entire process has been creating a system that allows you to easily construct um, a campaign frame that isn't going to require a huge amount of prep on your side, 
um, and that's going to lead you to these actions. Hopefully, allowing people a feeling of confidence uh, if this is maybe their first game running in. Uh, from a, do you need to have played Return to Dark Tower? The answer is absolutely not. Um, you know, the, there was, there's no expectation um, that you have. It's just that if you're into Return to Dark Tower, if you're into the original Dark Tower, um, you know, you get to play around and, 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 and hang out a little more uh, in that world and do some new, discover some new cool stuff, um, I hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and 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 all, all all of that. So, yeah. Now, when it comes to the, I think the big reason that I that I asked that kind of thing is one of the things that Dark Tower is is most known for is the board as well as the well Dark Tower. Yeah, and the that's tower. certain that's certainly present in the mock up that you that you have on the Kickstarter page. What I well, what... Yeah, we actually asked that question, right? We said, um, how, how do you do Return to Dark Tower without the tower in the middle of the board? And we said, well, why don't we make a tower, right? Why don't we make a tower that's designed for the role-playing game? Um, and so that's what you're seeing in those mock-ups. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tower is literally a box that separates out into two pieces, and then you flip it over, and they magnet together to form a dice tower that has all of the relevant polymorph information on the outside of the tower. Yeah. Um, where, and... uh, where my question really lies is, how is a lot of people are shifting over to virtual tabletop, especially in the yeah. last two years. So how are you going to accommodate the tower when you can't do the tower in something like Roll20 or Foundry? You could probably do um, it in tabletop sim, but that's moot. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, so we are doing everything. In fact, if you back uh, on the Kickstarter, um, you will get the Return to Dark Tower uh, Roll Twenty module for free. It's included with every uh, you know every pledge from Digital Up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and how we're handling that is is, is really just images um, because there isn't any actual interaction with the tower um, that can be done in Roll Twenty at this time. So, mm -hmm. uh, you're really just rolling dice on top of it, which is un is understandable. And I'm getting, <laughs> I'm guess I'm guessing the same applies when it comes to the when it comes to the board game map. So the board game map will actually be in the roll twenty module, um, as a as a resource that you can get. Um, the the map itself is going to be, um, in the book. Um, we encourage, and the way things are is, is actually using the board game as like on the tabletop to play the game. Mm -hmm. And in, so to make it sure that we had an option in case people don't have the board game, um, we just hit a stretch goal to make a poster map. Um, because, you know, we want that world, uh, we want that world map to be part of the experience. So uh, early on in our design, we were really focused on the idea that... Um, Return to Dark Tower was a game about exploration and realized that that wasn't true. It's a game about travel, um, which is very different. Um, you know, exploration is, I don't know what's over that hill, so let's go find out. And travel is, we need this thing, uh, and here are the places that we could get it. What's the best route? What's the best route for us, right? It's more about, um, uh, you know... Uh, it's more about traveling around on the map than it is about discovering things on the map and knowing where people are. And hey, uh, our army is on the other side of the world right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, had come up in the design of the board game that Justin uh, Jacobson had told us was that at one point, him and Rob had sat down and said, like, we, we need a good understanding in our head about how big this place is. Mm -hmm. And so the Four Kingdoms, which is the name of the, the world around the Dark Tower, um, uh, the Four Kingdoms are about the size of Ireland, the island of Ireland. And so that has influenced my thought about how things move here. So each of the regions are about, you know, like they're, they're uh, you could, you could, you could ride, you could you could ride a horse from one to the other in a day, you know. 
um, is is kind of what it what it basically boils down to. Oh yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, given given the given the phase design and the fact that there is a time limit, I yeah. think it's Im I think it's important that multiple encounters, even if even if all roads eventually lead to Rome, that there's a lot of roads. Uh, oh, yeah. is that something that you guys have have had in mind when it comes to how one would structure um, a campaign with this system? Um, so, uh, my expectation, um, uh, because we are still moving some pieces around is that, uh, how you get to the end is totally up to the players. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, the worst thing that can happen to the players is they spend too much time, uh, uh, you know, messing around in a couple of areas and the adversary is able to open the tower early um so the expectation is is that every game of return to dark tower ends with the players facing the adversary uh and the question is is are they doing that at the tower or are they doing it at a place of the adversary's choosing mm -hmm. um uh, so, uh, you know, all roads in this case lead to the dark tower, uh, but, uh, sometimes the tower might get to you first. Um, I think that answers your question. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? I know it's, I know on the, I know on the page it said over 50. 250 pages, but. Uh, so I mean we're shooting for 250 we'll see where where we end up um uh we have a bigger page uh physical page than what we had in mazes because we are making this the size of an old TSR uh hardcover mm -hmm. um so we have a little bit more space to play with um uh you know but content wise um you know we, we have to include enough uh from from mazes so that you have um, all the stuff about playing. There's a lot less pieces, and then there's the focus on here's how you run the campaign, and you do these pieces, uh, and then there's the adversaries. Um, you know, uh, if we end up uh, short of that, it'll just give us some space to add a lot more world information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we will see at the end uh, when we get done all of the writing. Uh, where we're at. My expectation, though, right now, is it's somewhere around 250, so 250, 260, somewhere in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, our, our biggest problem right now is actually getting, um, you know, making sure that we are confident uh, in getting a, a full-color, shiny page, you know, glossy page hardcover printed in the current world environment. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, it is uh it, it is it is difficult right now yeah now what would you be plan what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version at the very least uh so our, our goal is to have this before next summer uh in physical so um at this point i don't want to give a piece on the digital but you know if everything goes well, it would be in, you know, January, February. So, mm -hmm. um, in, in order to meet um, all of the things, you know, we, we, we need to have it at the printers. Um, so, like, this, all this summer around this thing, we're still doing a lot of uh, tweaking and poking, uh, you know, so uh, all of our manuscripts are still in flux. So, one of the nice things is we don't have to wait for any art. All the art's done. Um, you know, so that definitely saves us uh, a bunch of time. Um, and we've already done, uh, you know, our layout uh, pieces. So, mm -hmm. again, I think that digital is going to come, you know, sooner than uh, sooner than later. But I don't want to promise anything because of the world we live in. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I can I can certainly get that. <laughs> well. I will. I will most definitely be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it develops. Yeah. 
but a little more than a week left. Mm -hmm. And congratulations on managing to get um just shy of eighty one thousand of uh, your goal of nineteen thousand. Yes, just you know, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. just getting there. But I, uh... with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time. Sorry, uh, carbonation out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from as the... <laughs> Sorry. All right. Jeez, I'm really out of practice. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. It's... Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Roger. This has been great. Yeah. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to The Madness. And there will be a lot more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.